There's a number of medications. I talked about them briefly before. Let me describe them in just a little more detail. We give beta blockers. Beta blockers block the effect of adrenaline on the heart and they decrease the heart rate. No surprise. You got a sick, tired heart. You don't want to keep it being having a very a high heart rate, you want to decrease the heart rate. And actually, sometimes the ventricle recovers when we get the heart rate, which had been 90, down into the 60s or 70s. Two, we can give ACE inhibitors. That's the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. What these do is they block the renin angiotensin system. They decrease the constriction of blood vessels in the periphery, drop the blood pressure a bit. They also increase sodium and water excretion. So you can see, a, they help by decreasing the work of the, of the left ventricle a bit, and B, they help get rid of some of the excess salt and water. Diuretics, I already mentioned, they increase urine flow and consequently increase sodium and water excretion by the heart. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, you can see that there are also uh, possibilities of increasing the squeeze of the heart. It turns out that increasing the squeeze of the heart can sometimes overtax an already tired heart, um, but at least one agent, digitalis, seems to be safe. In critical situations where the patient is in shock, that is, they have a dangerously low blood pressure, we give intravenous drugs, for example, intravenous adrenaline-like drugs that increase the contractility of the heart, but you can only do that for a short time because, in a sense, you're whipping a tired horse. So maybe it runs a little faster for a short time, but it dies sooner. So we're very careful with the use of drugs that markedly increase the contraction of the heart in heart failure. And again, here you see all the drugs listed that can be used. You can see the, the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, the diuretics, and then the inotropic agents on the far right are the ones we try to use as little as possible. And again, um, there are, there's patient counseling. We already talked about the lifestyle. Alcohol is a depressant on the heart, so we want patients drinking as little as possible. Smoking has to stop. We want weight control. Um, we want regular exercise. All of the lifestyle things, again, repeated to work with the medicines that we're giving or to work with the interventions. For example, opening up a coronary artery or replacing a heart valve. And further patient counseling, of course, involves the medications. Are the patients taking the medications, and are they taking them regularly and as, a, as appropriately prescribed? This is a huge problem. In the United States, many patients fail to take their medications. If there are surgical or catheter interventions, what these contain uh, and what they can do and what the potential complications are, one wants to reduce stress in the patient's life. One wants the patient to keep track of symptoms. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Is their weight gaining all of a sudden because of a marked increase in fluid retention? And of course, uh, we would like patients uh, to not overdulge in fluid intake and certainly come for follow-up visits with the doctor or the nurse clinician in order for us to monitor how things are going with therapy and if we have to make further adjustments in therapy. So, um, in conclusion, Heart failure is a growth industry, particularly in older individuals. It's caused by many diseases, but in particular by atherosclerotic heart disease that causes damage to the left ventricle. Again, left ventricular systolic heart failure is the commonest. The left ventricle doesn't squeeze as well, and the commonest cause of that, ischemic heart disease. Prevention, of course, is better than cure. I don't have to tell you that. And how do we prevent that? By controlling atherosclerotic risk factors before they put the patient in the heart failure uh, situation. Um, of course, um, there's a whole variety of diagnostic tests that we use when the patient presents with heart failure. But remember, the clue is in the patient's symptoms with confirmation by the exam, and then we do some sophisticated tests to see what's the cause of the heart failure and how severe is the ventricular damage. Uh, and then we introduce a whole variety of therapies, both drugs and even uh, some of the newer device therapies. For example, we can open up blood vessels and even in extreme cases, we can take over with little pumps for the heart while we're trying to get it to respond and, and come back to normal. 
And of course, uh, then we're going to have to uh, uh, do a lifestyle changes. There's a new pacing protocol with a special pacemaker that can, in some selected patients can improve the pumping of the heart. All of these are fairly extreme uh, things done uh, right at the end. And again, uh, we talked about uh, the fact that there's a lot of technology here, but the best deal is to stop the heart failure before it starts with reduction in risk factors or identifying it early and getting all of those things, including the lifestyle changes, implemented before the patient progresses to a point that they need things like biventricular pacing and heart-lung machines and so forth. Thank you for listening to this lecture. I look forward to seeing you with the next one. You just completed your first video of the world's best medical exam preparation. Lecturio brings the knowledge of worldwide leading medical experts and teaching award winners to your PC, tablet, or smartphone. Prepare yourself and check your progress with thousands of quiz questions customized to USMLE standards. And the very best, you can get in touch with our medical experts personally. Visit Lecturio.com now and continue with the most inspiring medical education around the globe, anytime, anywhere.